All right. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Uh, please chat me if you cannot. Uh, I'm really excited to be with you today. It's 201. So let's get started. I've got a couple of announcements uh, in the beginning here. So just give me a second. Let me pull these up. All right, so once again, welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Slade, and I am the Assistant Academic Director of Temple University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute. Hopefully you've seen me from in some of our prior webinars welcoming you. Uh, but if you this is our first time together, a big welcome to everyone who's joining us. I'm really excited to hear from Yancey. Uh, so I'll make a couple of brief announcements and then get started. Um, so we are part of the Innovation Leader Speaker Series today, and that kind of grows out of um, one of our graduate programs, the Innovation Management Entrepreneurship Master's Degree. Uh, before I forget, we want to make sure to acknowledge our sponsors, which are uh, Temple, the, the Center for Student Professional Development. Also, the alumni relations people have been very uh, helpful, the Product Development and Management Organization, and the Innovation Research Interchange. So if you have any interest in, in uh, either of those groups, the PDMA or the IRI, please contact me and we can, uh, can link you up to them. So this series, oh, and I keep getting ahead of myself, we have a couple more webinars coming up, uh, Friday, June 12th, the State of the Entrepreneurial Ecosystem with our Executive Director, Ellen Weber and uh, Angel Investor, Glenn Gaddy. And then in early July, we'll have another webinar on innovation and leadership agility in times of crisis. So I hope you'll join us for those as well. Okay, so we this this series grew out of our innovation management and entrepreneurship master's program. Uh, we also offer certificates, so a bunch of graduate courses there. And we wanted to find some way to share some of these ideas and themes with the larger community and not just keep them in classrooms. Uh, we love teaching them in class, but we, we recognize that we want to also disseminate this in information to the wider community. So we have a master's program in innovation management and entrepreneurship and also graduate certificates, which are just three classes. Uh, so you could be done in as little as a semester if you really wanted to. Uh, if anyone's interested in those, please feel free to contact me. You can scan that QR code and we can uh, talk about that offline. Just to give you an idea of some of the things we talk about in our courses, um, creativity, here are some uh, courses that are coming up. This one uh, starts in a, in a few, uh, in a day, in a week or two, and then also is running again in the fall. So uh, this class is Creativity Unleashed with our adjunct professor, who is the Director of Innovation at Independence Blue Cross, Michelle Histand. Another course we're running is Entrepreneurial Thinking and New Venture Creation. Uh, these, these last three are running only in the fall with adjunct professor Rob Weber, who used to be uh, the CEO of a tech company, which was then acquired, and now he manages that product line uh, for, the com for the larger company. We have Open Innovation and Managing Strategic Alliances. Some of you may have been on our webinar with Leisha Davis a few months ago where she talked about some of the things she covers in the class. So maybe that piqued your interest and that is running in the fall as well. And then management of techno technology, technology and innovation with uh, adjunct professor Sri Sastradi, who was the former global R&D director for uh, an Arkema business line. So those are all running in the fall if anyone is interested. Okay, so let's get to why we are all here which is to hear from Yancey Strickler, the co-founder of Kickstarter, how we can be more self-aware in, in a crisis, which I think we'll all agree uh, we are in that moment right now, and how we can actually uh, make decisions in a way that not only helps us, but also helps the world. He'll talk about how a lot of times when we think we're making a decision in self-interest, we're looking too, uh, too narrowly and we're looking too short-term. So how can we make sure that our the decisions we're making are good for us now and good for us later? And also that means good for our families, good for the environment and good for the globe. So uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Kickstarter. It is a extremely uh, popular and well-known crowdfunding platform. It was one of the first, uh, if not the first of its kind where people like us could actually contribute and, and help fund ideas. And they've done almost uh, 5 billion in funding since the founding. So he'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, I'm really excited to hear about your philosophy, Nancy. Excited to hear from you and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, what's up? Thank you, Carrie. Um, 
Morning, afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share the screen. Um, weirdly, my computer always has a hard time with me going full presentation mode on Zoom. So you're going to see just me moving through my slides. Um, but I'd like to start just by giving a, a little bit of background on me and then getting into these larger ideas. Um, but I, I grew up here. This is the, the house where I was born and raised. This is in a place called Newport, Virginia. It's in Southwest Virginia near the, near the border of West Virginia. This is in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, my father was a traveling waterbed salesman. My mom was a, um, a secretary to college. My stepfather was a car mechanic. Um, so it was a lower, lower middle class life. I was the first person in my family to graduate college. Um, I went to the school of William and Mary. Uh, but growing up in, in Virginia, um, it was evangelical Christian, uh, and which I was very much a part of. Uh, but I always dreamed of the larger world. And, um, and after graduating college, I moved to New York City to pursue a, a lifelong dream I'd had of being a writer. And so I, I moved to New York and I became a music critic. Um, for about eight years, made a living, not a big one, but made a living writing about music for thing, for the Village Voice and Spin Magazine. I was never the best person at that, but I have a weird name, so that helped me stand out. Um, and so here I was really living my dream. I, I'd started a record label, um, just like making things happen. And it was during the midst of this time that um, that Kickstarter started. Um, now, the original idea for Kickstarter uh, came from Perry Chen. He's the gentleman sitting in the corner, sitting in the middle here. Um, Perry had the idea for Kickstarter in 2001. He was trying to put on a concert in New Orleans and it was going to have to front like $20,000 to do it and thought, what if instead I could propose the idea for the concert online? People would put up their credit cards, uh, but no one would get charged unless the show sold out. That way he wouldn't be responsible for making this decision on his own and said everyone collectively could, could come together and make it happen or not. Uh, but the, the internet in 2001 is a very different beast. Like there's no social media, there's no mobile internet. Like it's uh, to start a website in the early 2000s, you had to have a closet full of servers and a really smelly guy standing outside of it. Um, so when we started working on this in, in 2005, um, you know, we, we were non-technical people trying to do a technical thing. And, and, and here are the three co-founders, Charles Adler. Charles is a graphic designer on the left, Perry in the middle. Perry's an artist background, and that's me on the right. I'm a writer. Um, but we started trying to make this idea. We were so compelled by the notion of w letting the public vote for what culture they want to see. Um, this is the very first mock-up of Kickstarter. Uh, Perry made it, just sort of cutting and pasting other websites, like that's an early YouTube player there for the video. But a lot of the language of Kickstarter is there, back this project, a funding goal, a deadline. Um, and so a lot of the core of Kickstarter, that infrastructure, we had been thinking about for a while. It was just a matter of, of getting it out there. Um, this is a, an image of um, a whiteboard that represented a big moment for me. We were uh, working on the site more and Perry and I went to an Office Depot, Office Max or Staples, one of those stores and bought a whiteboard. And at the time for like an artist and a rock critic to go buy a whiteboard, I felt like, are they gonna check our ID? Are we allowed to do this? Um, but the, the, the line in between the business world and the creative world felt that, that significant. Um, and it felt like a big deal to be crossing it over, uh, crossing over it. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of challenge to getting the site launched. You know, Perry first had the idea in two thousand one, and it didn't launch until two thousand nine. Um, and and you know, there are a lot of different reasons for that. We were non technical founders trying to launch a website, which is not a good idea. Um, and we just had all the sort of struggles that you could imagine as a result of that. But finally, in, in April of two thousand nine, um, so just eleven years ago, Kickstarter launched. And this project was the first one to be successfully funded. It doesn't look like much. A, a guy said, if you give me $5, I'll draw you a picture of something. And it got $35 for, from three people. But for us, this was huge because this showed that the system worked. We didn't know any of these people. Uh, the credit cards correctly processed, the whole system functioned, and people understood what to use Kickstarter for. And that was just a, a huge validation. And from there, it, it's, it's gone on considerably. Um, multiple Oscar-winning movies have been funded uh, through Kickstarter. Cards Against Humanity began as a Kickstarter project. 
as did Oculus Rift. Uh, Peloton was a Kickstarter project. The Smithsonian restored Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. Um, but most projects are, are creative, artistic, and a lot of them are also quite unusual. Uh, for example, one of my favorites is a census done by a father and a daughter in Atlanta of all 90 squirrels in their local park. Um, what's interesting about all these ideas is that none of them, few of them have a real rational economic argument for existence. On Kickstarter, no one's posting their project and saying, look at this great business plan. And that's by design. There is no financial upside in Kickstarter projects because we saw from the beginning that the problem of creative projects, the problem of culture was the, the only projects that were getting funded were those that could produce a financial return. Only projects that had a, a, a financial component were worthy of a green light. And this greatly limited the scope of what was a good idea. And so the, the real model of Kickstarter is changing the reason behind something's existence from is this idea profitable to just do people want it to happen. And as a result of that, you get a million different reasons why something should exist other than its finan potential financial upside. Um, and so we've really built that into the core of the company. I mean, from the beginning, we were very set on being a, a purpose-driven company. We, we were not in it for the money. In fact, as founders, we vowed from the beginning that we never wanted to sell the company or go public if we were successful, that this wasn't going to be a financial cash out. The idea was to make something meaningful and to have it last as long as possible. That long-term meaning was the success that we would seek. And we even act, you know, put this into such an um, operational perspective that we reclassified the company to become a public benefit corporation in 2015. This is a, a for-profit company that is legally required to balance its financial self-interest uh, with producing a positive benefit to society. And Kickstarter's PBC charter includes things like the company will never use legal but esoteric tax avoidance strategies and will donate 5% of after-tax profits to arts and music education and to organizations fighting systemic inequality. Uh, and what's great about the PBC charter is it just it doesn't just rely on a good person to be rely to be leading Kickstarter at any moment, but it says for all time the company must follow these commitments. And that led us to think about our responsibilities in different ways. I was CEO when Kickstarter made this change, and shortly afterwards, we had the, the most high-profile project failure to date. Um, this is a project that had raised millions of dollars to make a drone and then just vanished. And everyone was quite upset about this, as you can imagine. Um, uh, so we ended up hiring an investigative journalist, and we gave them full access to us internally, asked them to try to talk to backers of the project, try to speak to the creators, and write the expose of exactly what went wrong. And that turned into this essay uh, that we widely promoted, even though it was quite negative uh, for the company to say, hey, here's a, a project that went badly. But for us, being a public benefit company, we felt like we should own the good and the bad of crowdfunding. The notion that here's a system where anyone can get funding for an idea, people can come together excitedly about a project, that there's also some downside to that and some risk to that that people need to be aware of. But you put it all together and the, the impact of Kickstarter is almost $5 billion gone to creative projects, uh, more than 100,000 projects funded. But there's also a, another level of impact. Um, in 2012, uh, we did a study with the Wharton School um, where they wanted to see the effect of Kickstarter projects after funding. And there they track two things. They track the failure rate of projects and also what are the economic outcomes of projects. This study found that 9% uh, of projects fail to complete as promised. So 91% of projects are completed as expected, 9% fail to do so. And then of the projects that are created, these were numbers as of 2012. So I would guess this is at least double at this point. But in 2012, they'd found more than 300,000 full and part-time jobs created, 10,000 new companies and nonprofits. And they said for every dollar pledged on Kickstarter, it's an additional $2.50 of economic stimulus that happens in that creator's uh, home location. So you could say for that almost $5 billion pledged now, that's over $10 billion of money that's gone into creative communities through Kickstarter. Um, so that's like my story to now, but that's we could talk more about that in the Q&A, but that's not what I want to dive into today because um, we're in a different moment, right? This is not, this is not the, normal, uh, the normal times that we've been used to. Um, that we, are, we are in a crisis moment. And, and what's interesting is that in a crisis, everyone has the same reaction to run away from the scary thing. 
but a smaller number of people have an idea that they're running towards. It's not just fleeing something, it's running towards something. And normally in a movie, this is Tom Cruise. Tom is running to save his family or to save the world. And that quality that Tom has that lets him do that is self-awareness. Now, I understand that self-awareness in a crisis might sound like a, a luxury, like Prada and a pandemic, but this is the key to survival and, and doing more than just surviving to, to thriving. Now, we think of self-interest today in a quite specific way. Um, while I was writing a book, my book, I was uh, trying to imagine and, and I gave myself this task of how do I visualize self-interest? It was immediately clear to me how we see it today. It's, it's the hockey stick graph a chart of whatever it is that we want, uh, money, power, units sold, popularity, uh, that it's growing so fast the line slopes up and to the right. And this we think is life's best case scenario. Um, but yet while we hyper-focus on creating hockey stick graphs, there's a larger world that we miss because the x-axis measuring time, it keeps going from now all the way into the future. And the y-axis measuring our self-interest, it also keeps going. Because as our self-interest grows, so do our responsibilities. The difference between being a solo entrepreneur and having a team is huge, or being single and having a family. As our self-interest grows, our responsibilities go from me to us. So we can actually think about there being four distinct spaces of our self-interest. There's now me, what I want and need right now. This is the realm of self-interest we're most familiar with today. This is where hockey stick graphs live. But there's also future me, what the older, wiser version of me wants me to do. That person becomes real or not real every day based on the choices that we make. There's now us, our friends, our families, our coworkers, the people that we care about and who care about us. And finally, there's future us, our kids if we have them, or just everybody 30 years from now. Now, every single decision we make leaves a footprint in all of these spaces. These spaces are being shaped by our actions all the time. And yet today we're functionally blind to everything other than now me. We think that's all there is. Now, when I first drew this chart, I thought, what is this a picture of? And I just wrote a very simple description next to it. I wrote beyond near-term orientation. And as I looked at those words, I suddenly realized that they made an acronym. They actually spelled bento. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a bento box the Japanese compartment lunch with four boxes and a lid. The bento allows you to carry a variety of dishes, not too much of any one thing. And the bento, because of its perfect balance, it makes sure that you don't overindulge. In fact, it honors a Japanese dieting philosophy called harahachibu, which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full, that way you're still hungry for tomorrow. This is why you're hungry after getting sushi. Uh, so the bento, uh, the bento box and bentoism is the same thing, but for our values and our self-interest. A way to not just overindulge for now me, for right this second, but to leave space for tomorrow and the people in our lives instead. Now, this is not just a theory or a picture. This is actually a user interface that you can use to make decisions. So let's imagine a smoker asking their bento, should I quit smoking? Now, to do this is very simple. The, the smoker simply isolates and asks each voice on its own to see what it has to say, because each dimension of your self-interest will have a different rational point of view. So the smoker is now us. It says, yes, you should quit. My family hates that I smoke. Like, it's, it's bad for the kids. The smoker's future us says, yes, you should quit. What if your kids smoke because of you? The smoker's future me says, yes, you should quit. I want there to be a future me. But the smoker's now me is addicted to nicotine. And it says, no, don't quit. This is, this is great. Like, quitting is going to suck. And it has a rational point of view based on a very limited perspective, right? It will be bad for that now me, even if it's good for all the rest of the dimensions of your self-interest. And so this shows the challenge with how we see the world right now. We have what I call a passive awareness. We can see a day or two ahead of, ahead of us, but we have a hard time conceptualizing anything beyond that. We know the future is real, we know that other people matter, but these are hazier concerns, much less clear and even less rational than just dealing with what I want right now. But the challenge of this is that it traps us in bad decisions. If you have a passive awareness and only see now me, 
that something like addiction can look like a, a good option. Hey, it's still satisfying my desires. The fact that it's bad for all these other parts of yourself doesn't matter. Those, part, those spaces aren't as real. When you also have a passive awareness, it makes something like sacrifice, giving up something now to get more later, or giving up something individually so others can have something instead, it makes that decision unthinkable. This is a, a sacrifice is a, a trait of quality that theoretically our society celebrates, but yet we've built a society that makes sacrifice completely irrational because we're all just meant to, to look out for our now me self-interest. The need then is to develop what I call an active awareness, to see all aspects of the bento, to have just an acute of an awareness of future me and future us and now us as you do now me. If you have this kind of awareness, then you make decisions that satisfy not just that one box in the bottom left where hockey stick graphs live, but you look for answers that satisfy all of your needs. Now, this is especially possible if you know what's going on in your own bento. And there, there's just a very simple question to answer. For now me, you have to know what you want to need right now. For future me, what your older, wiser version of you wants you to do. Now, I went through this process myself just using simple brainstorming. What do I want to need in my now me? I wrote down things like good health, money in the bank, a sustainable lifestyle, self-awareness. My future me, I talked about not selling out, being loyal, loyal to my values, being open to self-correction. My now us is about deep time with a very small group of friends and family. I'm hyper present. My future us is about building a world that's more just and is environmentally and ecologically sound. Now, this is a lot to keep in mind, so I tried to shorten this as something I could remember. And so I came up with a simple phrase in each box of the bento to remind me of what my values are and what it is I'm best at. So my now me is to show people the matrix. This is when I'm connecting ideas, showing people how the world works. This is when I'm most in flow with myself, and also I've seen when I bring the most value to others. My future me wants me to create harmony. I'm a child of divorce, so I, I really am drawn to pulling people together. And also to not sell out. That's come up over and over for me in my career. My now us is about a small group of family and friends and deep time with them. And my future us is a, a better matrix, not imagining a world where decisions aren't being made for us, but one where they're truly helping us rather than often working against our interests. Now, ever since I made this bento, I've used it to make essentially every major life decision. Not long after this, I got asked to, to do a talk for a company I didn't like. Now, I've been asked to do these things often in my career, and I've always said no. It feels like selling out to me, and I get irrationally angry for even being invited. But I got asked to do this shortly after coming up with the bento, so I thought, well, I need to ask my bento what it says I should do, and I was quite surprised by what I found. My now me, which wants to show people the matrix, says, yeah, you should do this. This is what you're all about. My now us, which wants deep time, says an hour and a half to present ideas. We're cool with that. My future us, which wants to build a better matrix, says you're not just here to preach to the choir. Like, this is absolutely where you should be. But then my future me, the part of me that says don't sell out, it says no. It accuses me of selling out. It says I'm betraying my values for reasons of money. And when I saw this for the first time, I realized that this voice that had been so angry and irrationally offended at having been invited before was my future me. And my future me was my bouncer, this big dude, standing outside my values and trying to block anything from coming in that I thought I wouldn't like. Now, this future me bouncer was doing its job, but it was also blocking me from doing something that was in my larger self-interest. And it was only because I could see this larger picture that I could tap that bouncer on the shoulder and I, I could say, no, nah, no, nah, it's cool, I got this, don't worry about it. I could see how a decision that even though it seemed to be against the desires of my future me was still in my self-interest and a decision that I should fully accept and step into. Now, the bento is also something that works for an organization. The, the, the same dimensions apply, but they map slightly differently. For an organization, it's now me are its immediate priorities. And, and basically for every company that is to be profitable or grow. Um, this is often expressed as KPIs or your mission statement. A company's future me is its ideal product. This is this image you're, you're projecting as, as uh, in your marketing. You're trying to say that the ultimate version of our product creates this feeling in you. By buying this product, uh, you will also get this feeling. 
A great example would be Apple's idea of think different. The Now Us is listing out all the company stakeholders, its investors, employees, its customers, its community, its suppliers, and also laying out what is the exact promise you're making to each of those groups. If you're telling uh, your investors that you're always going to give them transparent updates, well, you better make sure you do that. And finally, the future us for a company is its vision statement, where it wants to be in 10 or 20 years. A great example is uh, Microsoft saying a, a computer on every desktop. So for a company to make decisions, they should seek to make choices that light up every one of these bentos, that satisfy all of these requirements. Now, here's a real world example that shows what's interesting and challenging about this. So let's imagine this is Apple's bento. Apple's now me are tools that advance humankind. Uh, this is their mission statement from the very beginning. And so their Apple's now me desires are to build tools that advance humankind that also are profitable and grow. Uh, Apple's future me is this brand promise of think different. In the 90s, Apple established that as how we should think about their products. And so the, the promise is that if you use an Apple product, you will also be different. Uh, the now us of Apple, well, it's, it's promise to its customers is really interesting because since the 1980s, Apple has always been kind of the just works technology product. If you compare the early Mac OS with, say, MS-DOS, it was the most user-friendly, and that's always been how they presented themselves. Apple has also placed some flags around privacy and around a walled garden, protecting users as part of what they offer. And then Apple's vision statement is tools that advance humankind and grow Apple. Now, what's funny is that for every company, it's now me and it's future us are essentially the same. It's to grow, and it's a future where they and their category are more important than they are now. So if every company's now me and future us are the same, then companies distinguish themselves by how good a job I do, they do at meeting those now us and future me values. How well do they define that brand promise and how well do they live up to it? And how well do they define their stakeholder promises and how well do they live up to those things? So there's two Apple products that show you how this works, uh, one successful and one a failure. The Apple AirPods is an example of a very successful new product that totally fits the bento. Uh, it's a tool that advances humankind, it grows Apple, sure, it thinks different, it has no wires, but it also satisfies this customer expectation of being the just works product. The fact that you put in AirPods and they just automatically play, you pull them out and they stop. It's this magical moment in them that makes them very Apple. Now, if you compare this with something like the Apple Touch Bar, uh, which is a failure as a product launch, you can see the difference. Uh, yes, the touch bar thinks different. It's like a, a, new, a new feature on a laptop, but however, it doesn't just work. It didn't actually provide any functionality. That was the most common complaint. So Apple satisfied one part of the bento, but failed to satisfy another. And for that reason, the product wasn't as coherent as something like the AirPods. I think this also explains why something like Apple Music or Apple TV Plus are questionable moves according to their strategy. It's not clear whether this is something that customers are really expecting, but maybe Apple's trying to change our set of expectations. We'll see. So there's, there's an enormous advantage to expanding your perspective from the passive to the active awareness. When you have just the passive awareness, you are just trying to get attention like everybody else. You're out there just raising your hand saying, me, 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 uh, trying to get yours. But to have an active awareness, you can see that to, to get what you want and, and to, to create value in the world is not just about that now me, it's anticipating the future, it's about thinking about other people. It's ultimately about expanding the perimeters of your self-interest, right? If, you're, if your self-interest ends with now me, then you're gonna keep making bad decisions. But if you expand your perimeter, then it allows you to anticipate the future and even shape it before it arrives. It allows you to think about providing value to others, which provides all sorts of returns over the long run. So what the bento gives then is a kind of a bird's eye view, a bird's eye view that brings coherence. Now coherence is a word I found myself using a lot and it's a physics word talking about when light patterns are in, in perfect sync with each other. And coherence is kind of a, an idea of harmony, all these pieces working together. When you're in coherence as a person or as an organization, it means that all of your decisions are naturally fulfilling your goals. Everything you're doing is reinforcing everything else. Everything is amplified. Being in coherence with your future self is almost like you're creating an invisible string between you and this ultimate version of you, that you're pulling your way there. Or it's about amplifying yourself through others and reinforcing the value you create. 
Now it's this kind of awareness that Tom Cruise has in all the movies, right? This is what he has. He's seeing this bigger picture. And this crisis state that we're in, it may seem like it's ebbing at this moment, but this is a new normal. COVID-19 is just nothing but a, a small test for the climate crisis that's gonna be even larger and harder to confront. The notion of being in a state of permanent crisis is a new normal we must get used to. Now the challenge of COVID-19 is, is distinct in that it's created this personal crisis of all of us being locked in our homes with all of the different contradictions of ourselves. Success in the life before COVID was about having these very compartmentalized self. We have our, our exercise self, our animal self, our relationship self, our work self, our, our secret self, all these different aspects of self that we're moving between. And we had our commutes and different roles to play that allowed us to move between them. But now in this moment, they're all just piled on top of each other. And it's harder than ever to know who you actually are. Now, the way I do this and, and try to build this muscle memory is just a very simple weekly practice. On Sundays, I write down in my notebook, how should I use my energy? And I draw a blank bento uh, to, see, to see what sort of ideas come out. Now, the first time I, I did this, my book had just come out and, and I was obsessed with its commercial success. I spent all day just refreshing social media, uh, looking for positive affirmation. And I was trapped in this loop and I, I had this idea of actually, I, I need to use the bento to, to jolt myself out of it. And so that morning I took just five minutes to write down what each box of my bento said I should do. My now me told me I should do a sweepstakes, I should do a giveaway, I should promote, I should write a newsletter. That voice that wanted attention was there and was fully represented. But my future me voice said, hey, you should read this book, you should deepen your knowledge, you should make this bigger connection. My now us said, you should spend time with your family. Like you should talk to a friend that will bring you so much benefit. And my future us said, why are you caring about this book? This thing already happened. There's a whole world of work to be done. Stop obsessing over something that doesn't matter anymore. I ended up after this process, I made a to-do list for the week ahead based on these ideas. And I thought I'm gonna start shaping my time, not just according to the errands of now me, which of course still have to get done, but I'd actively think about how am I manifesting this larger world that I want. Uh, over the past two months, this is something that I've done every Sunday morning uh, with people online in a Zoom room just like this one. We all journal together. It's just a 20-minute process. It's a great community. If you want to join, you can just go to that URL. I send out a, an email every week announcing a Zoom link and, and times. Um, so please join us. It's a great, it's a great community. Um, the last thought I want to leave you with is, is just the power of the bento and, and its power beyond even just this moment. Um, so let's imagine this is you. Here's your bento. I have slightly relabeled it. You're now me, I call you. Your future me are your values. Your now us are your relationships and your future us are you too, your, your children. Now let's imagine you have a kid. And we build their bento onto yours. And here you could see how the relationship between you and your partner forms a propulsive force behind them. It shapes them. And your values of you and your partner form a foundation that defines who they will become, just as they will do for their children and just as our parents have done for us. And so there's a natural process that happens through time that I call the values helix, where certain values will diminish or grow based on how aware of them we are. If a value is something that we're really thinking about and making top of mind, then it will get pushed forward and it will grow over successive generations. But in a world where we're all trapped of only now me, not seeing beyond our moment, not seeing beyond ourselves, then we are totally giving up our power to influence the future. And we are allowing the future to be shaped by larger forces than ourselves. So the benefit of stepping into the bento and having that active awareness is bigger than you in this moment, bigger than then getting, reaching your goals for the next year, there is a larger generational implication here. Now I go into all this stuff and a lot more in uh, my book, This Could Be Our Future, that just came out. And if you're interested in following up, um, yeah, I would suggest you join the weekly bento and see what that's all about. I also have a newsletter uh, at ideaspace.substack.com. I will now stop sharing and we can start talking. What is up? Okay, great. Thank you so much. I, I especially love the point about all of ourselves have become conflated now. Everything is, 
you're we're taught we're taking care of the kids and working and cooking all in the same you know space very interesting okay so we will take your questions yancy do you you want me to read out the questions to you does that does that work sure okay um we've got a couple questions already uh alan asks i think this is a very interesting question based on your bento mm -hmm. how do we get people to wear masks when they're outside yeah, great, great question. Because um, I think the smoking one gives a great illustration of that. Um, you know, for smoking, it's like, it is the smokers now me that has the hardest time um, agreeing to quit. And so how have we tried to change smoking rates? Well, we've tried to make it harder for people's now me's to quit. We've done this by raising taxes on it to make it more expensive. We've done it by creating public shaming. Uh, you know, you can't smoke cigarettes in certain areas. We've tried to default um, sort of society towards being an anti-smoking position just to, to make it harder for that now me answer uh, to be yes. In the case of, so in, in this case, people are changing. Now, when does a smoker change their opinion? Normally it happens after a family has forced them to, a bad doctor's visit forces them to. Um, normally it's, it's, it's not explicitly by choice, it's reality sort of making that choice for them. Um, how will mask wearing change? I think it is, uh, you know, just in the event that uh, there are COVID outbreaks where, where people live, I think the idea that um, masks are a political statement will seem absurd when it becomes the difference between life and death. But until that moment, um, masks will probably continue to be more of a symbol, uh, at least in certain communities. All right, great, thank you. Um, for Matan, we have Yancy, great talk, love the concept. Um, could we move, um, Let's so see. Yeah, I could, yeah, so he's okay. saying as we move, so thank you, Ratan. You're saying as we move from like the me into those other spaces, um, the greater the potential for everyone. I, I agree, I agree. You know, I think the key is, is um, to recognize that, isn't, that it is in our self-interest. It is in each individual's self-interest to do so. The, there's a, a problem where um, people want to change the values of others. You want to reprogram people's values or force them to adopt a value system that's not their own. Um, those kinds of models will never work, um, but because that's it, tyranny, it's always tyranny uh, to force one value system on another. Um, but instead, if it's about making people uh, aware of the spaces where their actions have an implication, um, to me, that allows people's value systems to build on that. And you're just sort of expanding the playing field. Um, and I think there's some very natural things change as a result of that. For one thing is that um, financial value uh, begins to look uh, less important. Like we're in a world now where uh, the stock market and, and financial valuations are sort of the thermometer of society. But in a world where you imagine society as being multidimensional, you know, that's one metric on the dashboard, but it's just one of uh, several. Um, so I think that the implications of this are, are significant um, and I'm really focused on, in the book, I talk about there being a 30-year theory of change. And so I think about this, this notion of self-interest being redefined in this, in this kind of way um, as being something that's like so accepted that uh, this conversation seems absurd and, and incredibly boring 30 years from now, because everybody knows this. To me, that is the, would be the ultimate success. Great. Um, could you expand on the Helix concept a little bit? Um, uh, Richard says he loves the ongoing nature and wants a little bit more information about that. Yeah, well, I, to me, it's just, um, it's just modeling, it's just modeling out the larger implications of our, of our decisions. I mean, I, I you know, in the book I write about, uh, there's a value I write about in the book that I call financial maximization, which I define as the the assumption that the right choice in any outcome is whichever option makes the most money. And that there's, this is like this basic assumption we all tend to operate with now, but this is fairly recent. Um, and I show how the percentage of college students, college freshmen, who say being rich is an essential life goal has gone from 28% of them in 1970 to 86% today. Uh, and showing how just that's a steady climb and of all these values, this is a UCLA study that's been done since the 1960s, of all the values that have changed among college freshmen in terms of their goals in life, this is by far the biggest change. And to me, this shows the sort of like how these generational changes have kind of a compounding interest effect um, where these changes really add up and start to accelerate as they grow. Um, so 
what, what I think about this is like, um, especially as I'm doing a weekly journal to ask myself, what, what can I do in the next seven days to manifest the future us that I want? Uh, I start to think about this idea of the helix and just, okay, even if my choice at this second isn't going to change the world, let's imagine that somebody's watching. You know, it could be God, it could be Santa Claus, it could be my children, but somebody is watching and that this will be amplified a level out beyond me, uh, especially if I take it seriously and, and, and make it a core part of, of how I behave. Um, so I think it's just trying to, yeah, j just trying to see the larger implications of everything we do. Great, thank you. And speaking personally, I, I used to practice law and I made more money then, uh, but I'm much happier at Temple now. So, uh, so it is possible. And, and to still, you know, have a, have a decent life. Great. Uh, Janice asks, um, does the bento help with forming habits and what are your most helpful habits and routines? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I definitely think it's, it's great for habits because it's just, um, it's just discipline. It's just creating a, a, a form of self-discipline. Um, for how you think about things. I mean, uh, you know, I, I sort of look at things as, yeah, what, what, what actions fulfill um, this coherence of who I am? Like I, as I went through the process of laying out, here are my values, here's what's important to me, it became a kind of a filter for what I did and didn't do. Like what meets this? What, what sort of uh, amplifies and reflects what's going on here for me? Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's become a very, a very present thing. Uh, but it's also it's also something that I I'm, I learn I'm learning more about all the time. I've, I've given workshops now to several thousand people, teaching them how to build their bento. And and what I find is that uh, you know, there's a huge variety of responses. Uh, but a lot of people, as I find women especially, will respond by saying their their mind is already thinking about all of these things, and that this is a helpful structure like a UI that just lets that allows you to do that repeatedly. And I think that's, that's really what's helpful is that, you know, most likely you're doing a lot of self-critique, a lot of self-awareness, turning things over in your head. You have your scripts that you play, your sabotaging voices that you go to when you feel fearful. Um, and so what is that sort of internal anchor in your mind that will allow you to not get swept away with whatever the, the crisis at the moment is, and there will always be one, but instead to stay grounded in like just the, the essence of you. Um, and so that, that is what I think is so important. And that's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do without, um, without making those kinds of commitments. And so once you have that, then, you know, creating behaviors that manifest that larger, that bigger version of you um, become meaningful. Um, my, my future me is someone I think about all the time. Um, when we do the weekly bento process, I have people close their eyes and we sort of look around as if we're inside our bento. And I always picture a future me as like the Obi-Wan Kenobi version of me that nailed every choice. And when I look at that person, you know, they, they smile at me with such warmth. Like that person loves me more than anyone. And it's because I, I, I had this realization one day that I look back on like my adolescent self with such compassion. I feel sorry for him. He had a really hard time in life. He was doing his best. It was hard. It was hard. He had to go through those things. And I look at him with such love. And it occurred to me like, well, of course my my future me looks at the me of today with that same compassion, with that same feeling of, hey, you're, you're doing your best and yeah, you're going to mess some things up. But like, you know, you, everybody is. Don't, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. So it's like this, this loving voice that I can turn to. And that, and that tells me that making these smaller sort of atomic habit changes is building to something because I'm looking at that person, you know, this, this salt and pepper, older, wiser version of me, my Obi-Wan, and I'm like, I can get there. You know, I'm reaching out my, heart, my hand as far as I can to grasp it. Um, and so it just provides that kind of meaning and that larger purpose to actions that otherwise are like hard to get excited about. Great, thank you. Um, someone who's uh, anonymous asked, how would you av advise us to integrate our life as now me to eventually pursue our future me? And it seems like you, you addressed that a little bit in what you just said. Is there anything else to add to that? Well, I, well, I think that these, the, these dimensions ladder up with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs very well. Um, so I think the two bottom rows of Maslow, safety and security, I think that's your now me. And, and I do think like you have to put your own mox oxygen mask on first. Um, if you know you need to feel secure to do and to do other things, so I think that the focus on that is is totally right. Uh, 
the challenge and the interesting trick is that when you experience material success, it becomes very easy to become increasingly materialistic and very now me oriented. Um, we have an assumption that wealthy people are more, more virtuous and that wealthy people have the time to give to others and are, you know, the bento, bentoism must be a tool for wealthy people. Um, but actually, if you go to any major religion, you know, the, the, Bi the Bible says it's easier for a, a camel to pass through a needle's eye than a rich man to go to heaven. Um, because wealth, is, wealth and materialism have been seen as impediments to self-actualization, to seeing a larger picture. And I think the bento kind of shows what this is, where if you're overindulging in now me, even if you have a good 401k, you're like leaving other parts of your life uh, sort of more poor. But if you imagine someone that has less money, um, you can imagine how their now me being more difficult might force them to reach out to the now us of their community to rely more on other people and as a result have stronger relationships. And also maybe the future me importance comes from something like religion, which has higher rates for people of lower incomes, where you're creating extra purpose and meaning on your choices by thinking of their ultimate, ultimate uh, implications. So I feel like the, the, the now me is important to get right it's also the most dangerous space because it traps us. It, it traps us in decisions that feel good, but that aren't actually taking us anywhere. Very, very interesting. Uh, Charles asked, uh, I was wondering this too, how did you feel after you gave your corporate talk to the company you didn't like? Yeah, I felt, I felt, um, I felt, I thought shame on me because I go there and I discovered they were inviting me because they wanted to do all the things I might want a company like them to do. And they wanted me to come talk about it. But yet, you know, snooty me, pre, pre bento me would have been whatever, whatever, bro, <laughs> about that. But yeah, no, it was, it was entirely, I mean, this is a Fortune 10 company in the world um, that uh, had come to feel that they have an enormous amount of financial success, but that they don't provide much meaning and that actually people don't care about them or believe in them. And for the first time they were coming to see that as a, a limitation, a liability. Whereas in the past it seemed like it hadn't mattered. Um, but there's a sense that the values are changing, right? And, and in every category, there's now like the social good player um, or the most transparent player. And these are all examples of like very new values that have emerged. I mean, transparency as a value in business is like, really only about 20 years old. Like that's a post Enron, post financial crisis kind of value. So these things change quite a bit. Great, um, Peter asks, let's see here. How did you come up with the name Kickstarter? When did you know or feel it was growing legs and starting to actually thrive? Um, Perry came up with the name. We had uh, many names. The first name was Critical Mass. Um, and then we got Kickstarter. First, it was Kickstarter without an E, so like a web 2.0 kind of name. Um, the critical mass happened, it was within the first two or three weeks. I mean, you know, we were a new platform trying to introduce a totally new form. I mean, there, there have been a few crowdfunding experiments on the internet, but nothing had taken and no one had expressed it in the structure that we had done it. And, um, and so initially, we were just trying to like validate the model. Um, but one, one very good decision we made early on was that we limited access. We created false scarcity around using the product. We made it to where you had to apply to create a project. Um, and we, gave, we also gave invitations out to like 50 of our creative friends and they got five invites that get, they could give to other friends. And it was like that for like the first year. And so during that time, it was a real, um, you know, it meant something to get an invite to start a Kickstarter project and people would write in asking us to give them invites and we would give them to most people. Um, but in that way, it just created this, uh, this desire to get in and, and it allowed the, the culture and language of the platform to be set early on by people that we knew if reflected the values we wanted the platform to have. So the one rule we had from the beginning was no charitable projects, um, no general business expenses, like this is a creative platform because Fundraising at that point was still like Jerry Lewis telethon and, and like save a child that's starving. Like, you know, guilt was primarily how people raise money from the public. And so we were really trying to redefine that and redefine it for a creative community. So that meant we needed to have a distinct universe with a distinct language that you couldn't have anything that made you feel bad. Um, and so like the informal rule for the first year was just no bummers, nothing that felt 
depressing, nothing that was playing on guilt, because for us, that so, we so strongly associated that with fundraising, and we're really trying to define a, a new culture around it. Interesting. Um, Jaron asks, do you think social media and the internet in general incentivize the paradigm shift you are looking for? Uh, or disincentivize it, perhaps? Yeah, I think the jury's still out. I, th I mean, I think the internet is a positive force. Um, I think that uh, humanity remains humanity um, is the problem. <laughs> and I, I don't know how to get, get move away from that problem. Uh, I think that there is a there's definitely a now me cheap dopamine factory of the internet that is problematic. On the other hand, I do think that we are creating a global brain. You know, we are all like neurons on this larger brain that is co-computing uh, like crazy. And we're seeing it, especially now, like the kind of interaction that's happening and uh, the world coming together to, around COVID-19, which it's amazing to imagine the degree to which this would have been happening if there were different leaders. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I think that it is uh, connecting us and it is deepening us and that um, it's easy for me to imagine that in the same way there's like Moore's law of, of processors where the theory that every 18 months to two years, the processor speed will double and the cost will cut in half. Maybe there's the same idea, but for human global consciousness, maybe every 18 months, like our level of consciousness is expanding. Uh, as we become more connected through the network. I think there's a lot of things to suggest that something like that may be the case. And perhaps from, if you take that angle, then maybe consciousness, uh, an expanded human consciousness is actually the post-internet technological evolution, right? That the internet has allowed us to better see each other, to better see these dimensions of ourselves. And it's the growing awareness of that uh, that is going to be whatever the next phase of, of innovation is. And that that's what's happening at this moment. There's, there are very strong arguments that would say the course of human history really has been about a raising of consciousness. Um, and, uh, and so I think that I think that, that might be uh, part of what's happening now. Uh, and I don't think that that happens without the internet. Great. Uh, Chino asks, what advice can you give to a journalist that wants to transition from freelancer to starting their own online publication? And what Kickstarter rewards would you recommend for a hyper-local news site for small business owners? Uh, great, great idea. I mean, I would say, um, you know, probably you start by creating that for free. I think you first have to, to give it away for free and, and demonstrate its value before you start to charge. Um, I would think about starting with like a free Substack email that you, you know, then upgrade to paid. If you're doing low, hyper local small business owners, then, you know, I'm imagining Facebook is probably how you're connecting with a lot of those folks. Um, so I can imagine how you might, how you might build that out. So I, I would say you're trying to plant a flag around what is that, is it about the hyper localness that is what's distinct? Um, is it a specific angle? Is it a specific, specific sector? Like as specifically as you can make your Venn diagram, uh, the better off you're going to do. Um, so I think that the moment for this kind of thing is now. And, uh, you know, if the market will support it, it, it will, but it, it can work. Great. Um, Richard asks, um, how far out is future us? For example, if you were applying the values uh, method to, the, to a company pivot or purpose, would it be a week or longer? So we'll talk about time periods a little bit. Yeah, you could say, I mean, I, I was writing about this today. I think for a company, it's probably like five to 10 years. But I mean, but you know, the average CEO's lifespan in a job is like uh, maybe four years. So maybe, maybe like the future is six months from now. Uh, but it's just, I think it's just not today. Um, you know, uh, so maybe for a company, you're talking a year or two, um, you know, a few steps away from where you are now. To me, that future us is it's like a, you know, one thing I would do often as I was, while I was a CEO is about every six months, I would take three or four days and do no like day-to-day -day work. Um, and I would do what I called concept car Kickstarter. And where I would uh, just try to imagine, I would always do five years, it's five years from today. Um, what are the most important things about our team, our product? Uh, are offering uh, the market that we're in and just like the state of the company um, and just go through a lot of processes tr just trying to imagine what might be important at that moment and and this ability like developing this muscle in your mind to try to 
project out. And yes, it's all like you're building fictions on fictions and who knows what's real in that. But it does give you some sense of say, what matters more and what matters less, which is really helpful. I mean, when I'm doing my weekly bento, normally what my future me, future us is telling me is like, don't worry about this thing. This thing that you think is important is not important. Like over and over that comes. Like I, my bento will often come with like, Twitter anxiety. I want, I, want, I, want, I want to be more viral or whatever those kinds of things are that we want. And my bento will always say, hey, this, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. This is, this is not the thing to be thinking about. Um, so, you know, it's just sort of like this, this not today perspective uh, that just, you know, ha, ha, is more aware of the world than you are in this moment. Great. Um, Rotan, I see your hand is up. So let me uh, see if you wanted to, to say something. Uh live. I'm going to unmute you. No, Carrie, I, I think I already asked my question. Good. Uh, okay, got it. I just didn't want to make sure. Talk, I think it, it, it comes, um, it definitely crosses over in the domain of philosophy. And uh, I'm glad Yancey is bridging the world of business and philosophy. And I think there's a lot more. We all of us have to traverse because we have been so caught up in the materialism and uh, more we can take these frameworks to bring people along that journey. I think better we are off as a humanity. Well, I think, you know, what I, what I really thank, thank you, Ratan. I, you know, I wholeheartedly agree. And what, like, I don't, I, I just think this is a better way. This is a better way to succeed. Like these are better outcomes. You know, I, I want, I want this perspective to win, not because it's the m most virtuous uh, or it fulfills like things we want to be true, but, but just because it will produce the best outcomes. Like Apple wouldn't, isn't it valuable for Apple to know why AirPods worked and why Touch Bar didn't? Like there, there's this great Drucker, Peter Drucker essay, I think about often um, called the theory of the firm, where he talks about how every company needs a, its core theory. Like what is it that we do and then you're applying that theory to every decision and that when your every decision is coherent in that way, that is when like you're truly operating at this highest level. So, you know, I, I, I think the benefits of this are enormous in all kinds of ways. But the reason why I think that people might adopt this is that I can just make the argument that this is in the benefit of your own self-interest right this second. And it's also going to be the minute for other people in the future too. But like for you, right the second, as a person or a company, this will be better off for you. And, you know, that's, that's the beauty of Adam Smith, right? Is the argument that people will act according to their own self-interest, which is totally right. I just think that we have settled on a more narrow definition of self-interest than is actually true. And that we're at a point now where we can expand that uh, to something that I think is more reflective of our reality. Great. Thank you. Um, Faraj asked, how did you build the Kickstarter platform without a technical background? So maybe giving some advice to people who are interested in having a website and things like that, but don't have that background. Yeah, I mean, this was in like pre AWS EC2. So it was even hard, like you couldn't even roll, you had to roll your own everything. Um, we did external consultants that went terribly. Um, more seasoned people kept telling us that this was a bad idea. We kept saying whatever old man, maybe back in your day. Uh, but it was right. It was a bad idea. Uh, in the end, uh, in the end, an interesting moment was we met someone who, uh, a guy named Andy Bayo, who's like an important figure on the internet, and we really got along well, and he's very connected to the dev community. Um, and so he just helped us find people. And what, what, we, what we had was like this, this validation um, of like when we would meet engineers before, you'd meet someone and afterwards you'd say, you know, we didn't know anything. So we're like, I don't know, Dimitri seemed like a nice guy. Sure, let's try it. You have no idea what to ask, what to ask someone. Uh, but then we have this third party here who, who knows more than us and who's looking out for us. So he can say, he can tell us, oh, this is actually a good engineer for X, Y, and Z reasons. And he can also say to that engineer, hey, these founders are like actually people worth working with for X, Y, and Z reasons. Because in those earlier days, like even if we'd met a great engineer or developer, like, why would they have worked with us? You know, the, their, the interviewing is going both ways. So in the end, it was having someone who is enough a part of our team to be invested um, and for that to be able to get better technical talent. And then we were fortunate 
in that one of those people that we brought on pre-launch um, was the principal architect of Kickstarter for the next 12 years. So that, that really worked out. Um, but, but yeah, it, it ended up taking like a, just a, a, a third party um, to help move that forward. Great. It's three o'clock. How's your time, Yancy? Do you have time for a couple more questions or need Can to I get do one or two more and then okay. pop off? Amber asks, um, sit, summarizing a little bit, how can we shift from a mindset of fear toward creativity in this current crisis? Um, well, you know, I think fear is appropriate. Um, you know, so I think I don't, I worry about moving on from fear faster than we should, you know, respect, respectful fear, I think is important. Um, you know, this is, it's, it's interesting because like there is a, there is a part of us that we have to survive this crisis. And, and there's a part, there's another part that's like, well, what, what comes after? And, um, and so holding those two things is, is interesting. And for me doing like the weekly bento process has tried to help me balance that. And the way that's worked for me is that my now will be, you know, just things I have to do. Um, and my future voice stuff is often like, try to operate from a place of this crisis being over and things are, and things are good. Like think optimistically about what could be there or, or try to imagine what might be more or less relevant when things do return to normal. And how do you, how do I act in such a way that I'm like manifesting that, that I'm, I'm putting out the right vibes almost. Um, and so, but it's hard, it's hard. I mean, we all want to rush we all want to move past this. I mean, I can't wait <laughs> to move past this, but this is, this is the challenge of a moment like this is that it's, I don't think it's our call really. And last question. Um, so you've talked about family and partner. What about people who don't have a family or don't have a partner? How should they, um, you know, structure your matrix? How can they consider their us? Yeah, I think of us is um, just people that you have an emotional relationship with. I mean, your us can be people that you don't like, <laughs> that are just like very much a part of your life. Um, I don't think us is every living thing in the world. It's not like we must account for every human when making decisions. I think that is an unreasonable expectation and will never work. Instead, it's just like, who are the people you really care about and love about? Who Who is affected by your decisions? And I think for all of us, it's similar groups of people, you know, it's people we work with, people we're friends with, people that we're tied to by blood. Um, and, you know, the way I visualize my us is I picture a sectional couch and I cram everyone, my oldest friends, coworkers, my family, even my pets. And I just cram them all into this one couch. I look at them with my eyes closed and I just take a Polaroid of them. And then I, I will sit there and I will just imagine scanning each faces and just thinking about them and just like acknowledging them. And when I do that on a weekly basis, inevitably I'll see like, oh, here are three faces that I feel less connected to right now. Let me make sure I talk to them at this moment. Um, and just use that as a reminder of like, who, who, who is my us? Who do I want to be caring for? Um, and not just when they need me or I need them, but just is, is, is part of a, a successful life. Um, so, you know, some people are great at these things naturally for other people. These are things that you have to force yourself to think about. I'm more of a force myself to think about these kinds of things person. Uh, and so for me, having a framework and a, a muscle memory, um, that I go through is incredibly helpful because left to my own, I fall short of what I say I want to be all the time. Great. Uh, we had one or two questions asking, uh, what does BENTO stand for again? And I think you said it was beyond near-term orientation. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry if I couldn't get to your question. I know we could, we could keep Yancy on here for another hour, but he's got other people to go inspire. So Yancy, uh, sincerely on behalf of Temple and uh, everyone on the call, thank you so much for, for sharing your insights with us. And yeah, buy, the, buy the book, everybody. If you liked what you, hear, you heard, buy the book. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. All right.